Welcome everyone to my fifth XCOM 2 War of the Chosen video. And this one should be a good run as we're looking at our first regular class, meaning not a hero or spark. As always, you can check out the previous videos on my YouTube channel. So today we're looking to answer the question, can you beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen using only specialists in combat? Specialists are tech-savvy units who use the Gremlin, a high-tech drone, to support the squad in combat. Their skill tree has two branches, like all the regular classes in the game. They can either focus on being a medic, or focus on hacking and dealing guaranteed damage with the drone. But both skill trees actually contain some skills focused on Overwatch too, and this is something not to be overlooked. Specialists are probably the weakest of the four base classes, but to counteract this, they actually level up the fastest. Well, to be more accurate, they need less XP than the other classes to level up. And unlike the previous classes we've looked at, these guys will be able to make use of the alien ruler armors, as well as some of the chosen weapons, so it may actually be worth engaging the rulers to get their loot. It should be a nice change of pace, and I'm looking forward to it. It's also worth mentioning that unlike the hero classes, once we have the Guerrilla Tactics school built, we can train as many specialists as we like. We're not going to have the same problem with troop limitations in this run. Now that is something I'm really looking forward to. So all that being said, what's my prediction for this run? Well, I'm not expecting it to be a cakewalk in the early, mid, or late game. Apart from being able to deal with mechs quite well, I generally see them as a support class. But here, they're going to have to hold things down all by themselves. Let me know your predictions in the comment section, and we'll see if we were right or not. Now, the usual rules apply. We're playing on Commander difficulty. We're playing on Honest Man, so we can only reload in the event of a misclick or glitch. And the big one, we can only use specialists in combat. Before we begin, I do live stream all these campaigns in full on my Twitch channel. There is a reward system for regular viewers over there, and you can actually have me make a character for you that will appear in these videos. A lot of the soldiers you'll see have been created by Twitch viewers. So please give me a follow over there if you're interested. The link is in the description. It could be your chance to lead us to glory, or be brutally annihilated on the battlefield. There's only one way to know. And with the cheap plug out of the way, let's dive into the challenge run. So I replace the normal starting rookies with 12 specialists, and away we go. In truth be told, at squatty rank, specialists aren't actually that different from rookies. They have better stats and can use aid protocol, but that's it. We get some bad luck right off the bat as Advent cut off our path to the roof. In this first mission, you always want to take high ground. Your soldier's aim is going to be pretty bad, and having a height advantage will give you a much better chance of hitting the enemies. And this mission is probably one of the hardest in the game, so don't feel bad if you do have to reload. Anyway, I lob a grenade, hoping to take out at least one of the advent troops, but no luck. So three troops are still alive, but we do have three attacks left. We make some easy shots on two of them, but the third is behind cover, and it's only a 65% chance to hit, so I decide to play it safe and use the grenade for guaranteed destruction. We move onto the roof to get that aim bonus, but I misclick and move Drifter out of cover. Yes, I have a character named after myself. I'm sure that's not going to get confusing at any point in the video. Now my worst fears are realised as he activates a pod while out of cover as well. Now I could reload here, it wouldn't break my honest man rule, but I decide on a less time consuming approach and just push on. We move the whole squad onto the next roof up, causing Advent to lose line of sight on us. The enemies move in close, which not only means we didn't take any attacks, but it'll be easier for us to hit the Advent troops on our turn. However, there is a downside as we've lost line of sight on the second trooper. We take out the captain as his marking ability is probably the biggest threat we'll face. I then find that missing trooper and he's actually much closer than I would have liked. So I decide it's us or them and we have to go all out. 
I move Kat down to take out the injured trooper, and she misses. Well, I guess it's us then. Anyway, Drifter thankfully takes out the injured trooper, but that leaves the last one with a free attack, and two of our soldiers are flanked on top of that. The trooper fires at Drifter, but thankfully misses and we're okay. We then take him out on our turn, and we've somehow managed to avoid taking any injuries, despite some pretty bad luck on this mission. We start research on modular weapons, construct a resistance ring, and build a flashbang. I actually don't build a medikit just yet, as our soldiers are still pretty expendable right now. We can easily replace them, so I'd rather have an extra grenade on missions than a medikit. And the reason I built the resistance ring instead of the GTS is because A, we have 12 specialists right now, so while training more rookies in the GTS later will likely be important, right now there's really no rush. And B, we can afford to be a lot more liberal with covert ops this run, as we'll have more spare soldiers to utilise, so getting the resistance ring up and running makes sense. The first guerrilla op objective is to neutralise the field commander. Not an easy start. I go searching for him before we break concealment. If we can take out the commander quickly, it will remove the time limit for the mission and allow us to play a bit more conservatively for the rest of the enemies. Remember, we're still kind of playing with rookies here as we have no particularly useful abilities just yet. Unfortunately, the commander is accompanied by a sectoid and trooper. I decide to engage, knowing I won't be able to defeat all three enemies in one turn, but I figure as long as we can take out two of them, we should be good. And the longer I wait, the more chance another pod will patrol into us. We thankfully take the trooper down in a single hit, and get some good damage rolls to finish the sectoid as well. I use aid protocol with Killjoy to boost Pyrotechnic's defense, Pyrotechnic is vulnerable to flanking in his current spot, so this will give him an extra 20 defense. We then flashbang the commander to shut him down. He takes a shot at us, but misses, and we then swarm him and fire away. It takes all four of our soldiers to do it, but we take the commander down. We can now take our time and overwatch creep through the rest of the level, and that's exactly what we do. The next pod comes around the corner, and we blast them, taking out the captain with overwatch shots. Unfortunately, our good luck is counted as a second pod activates at the same time. But even between both pods, it's only two troopers and a sectoid, so hopefully we'll be good. The first trooper is a one-shot, and I then try something a bit different. See, that second pod has to come through this narrow doorway if they want to get close to us. So I actually fall back out of line of sight, hoping to lure them into an overwatch ambush too. It doesn't really work though, as Advent is still able to angle a shot on us, and Killjoy takes damage. Plus the sectoid has raised a zombie, so now we've got an extra enemy to deal with. I should have just rushed towards them. So we take out the trooper, and then focus on the zombie. I don't normally worry about the zombies, as you can just take out the sectoid, and the zombie goes down too. But here, our rifles are doing 3 to 5 damage, and it seems like 3 has a higher chance of occurring than the other numbers. So, provided that our shots land, 2 shots to the zombie will guarantee its demise, but the sectoid with its 8 HP could survive. I figure a sectoid on its own is better than a sectoid and a zombie. And here's where the fun begins. The sectoid mind controls Kathleen, but we are able to flank it. Despite this, we get two 88% chance shots missing in a row, and now both Kathleen and the sectoid get to attack us. Killjoy gets gunned down in cold blood by the sectoid, and Kathleen opens fire on Red Devil, her own squad mate. Now interestingly, Pyrotechnic was the only one who actually made his point blank shot at the sectoid, so I'm kind of happy he didn't take any damage at least. And here, I start to kind of panic. I move Kathleen to flank the sectoid, not realizing she's out of ammo. So that's her turn wasted. Luckily, Pyrotechnic has one clip left, so we finish off this sectoid, and oh, oh goodness no. We miss a third 88% chance in a row, and the sectoid lives. 
The Sectoid then takes out Red Devil, and it's looking grim for Pyrotechnic. Thankfully, the mind-controlled Kathleen has to reload, so that spares us for one turn. Even better, we then gain control of her again. I repeat the exact same mistake with Pyrotechnic. I move him into flank, even though he's out of ammo. So that's his turn wasted. And our lives are now in the hands of a 50% shot by Kathleen. That she misses, of course. She takes some damage by the sectoid, but on our turn, we flank again, and after four attempts, finally make that 88% shot and finish the big-eyed demon off. Honestly, I have no idea what to say here. This was some of the worst RNG I've ever seen in this game. And yes, it is true, I did make some mistakes at the end there, but do you know what the chances of us missing the five shots in a row that we missed are? About one in 9,645. That is some monumentally bad luck. Let's hope this was a once-off and doesn't set the trend for the rest of the run. We've lost two soldiers, God rest ye souls, and I guess we'll be needing that GTS built sooner than I thought. And honestly, if this was a hero class run, I would have just restarted right here. But since we can easily obtain more specialists, I decide to push on. Hopefully the replacements we find aren't clinically blind. Next we have to rescue a VIP from the Lost. I talked about my general approach to these missions in the last video, and this one goes fairly by the numbers, so let's just move right along. Everyone on this mission gets a promotion after this one. Combat Protocol does guaranteed damage, and Medical Protocol lets us remotely heal soldiers using the Gremlin. My main plan for this run is to have one person on the squad focused on healing, and all the rest on the damage dealing perks. The GTS soon finishes construction, so I go to purchase some rookies, we need to train up some specialists to replenish the ranks already, and here something weird happens. There are soldiers available to recruit, who are already in the barracks. I'm not sure why it's happening. I'm assuming it's a glitch caused by one or more of my mods. But anyway, we recruit our old friend, Paul Green, and begin training him. It was that Paul Green. He's got sideburns and like no hair. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go with him. We'll go with Paul Green. He's gonna be the one rookie. Um, now she's probably gonna try and target this guy. Finally. So we don't. So we want him close to. I think where he'll be safest. I guess in here, won't he? Like he should be pretty safe there. Location confirmed. Just don't miss this skulljack. Imagine if after all this he misses. Yes. So we head out to the first retaliation mission, and the Twitch chat doesn't have a lot of confidence in my ability to keep their characters alive. Now after that second mission, I can't say I blame them, but I will do my best to bring everyone home in one piece. We've again got the Warlock first up, and my confidence in bringing the team home alive is quickly diminishing. We encounter our first pod of a trooper and sectoid, and we actually take out the sectoid on the overwatch. That's pretty cool. Needless to say, the lone trooper goes down quickly. The warlock calls in a zombie, which goes in a spectral rupture state. Since we're on the roof, I move DJ to block the pipe up, cutting off its access to us. It moves around to take the long way, and Cat, who is my sister's character, takes it out with overwatch. Now being on the roof is pretty good, as it gives us good line of sight over the entire battlefield. However, things get really bad really fast. A trooper, sectoid, and the warlock all come charging into our line of sight at once. The warlock goes for a mind scorch, and this is the reason I hate facing him in the early game. His psionic attacks can be brutal and very difficult to defend against. For some reason, he went easy on us with the skirmishes and didn't really use these abilities, but he is using them here. Thankfully, the attack misses and we're okay for now. I grenade the Warlock's cover, turning it into half cover, but even with this and him having the groundling weakness, which makes it easier to hit him from above, our chance of hitting is still only 65%. 
I decide to focus on the trooper instead and we take it out just barely. The sectoid and the warlock both hit us with a mind control, so we've just gone from four soldiers to two. Even better, Neam Leeson, yes that's his name and he is horrifying, <laughs> You have Twitch viewer Morocco to blame for this monstrosity of a man. Shout out to you, Morocco. But horrifying or not, he had the flashbang, and now he's mind controlled, so we can't even disorientate the sectoid to get someone back. This is looking really bad. Thankfully, Fail hits the sectoid with a clutch critical hit, leaving it with only 1 HP. Now, Cat has an 88% chance of hitting, but considering that previous mission, 88% might as well mean zero, so we take the guaranteed damage with combat protocol instead. That gives us Leeson back, who is able to flashbang DJ, so he hopefully won't harm us. Well, the Warlock daze has failed, and then something really messed up happens. The enemy uses DJ to gun down a civilian. Imagine being DJ in this situation, watching on helplessly as you're forced to shoot at an innocent person. It's actually pretty dark when you think about it. So on our turn, the Warlock has summoned a trooper, so we focus on taking it out and reviving failed. The Warlock, who we've barely been able to attack, starts to fall back. DJ does shoot at us, but he misses. Next turn, we thankfully regain control of DJ and start closing in on the Warlock. Things basically descend into a horror movie here as we're chasing the warlock through the forest while he frantically flees for his life. He finally decides to summon a spectral stun lancer when we have him cornered on the map. And after we take out the stun lancer, we go from horror to Three Stooges style comedy as Cat misses a point blank range at the warlock. He then returns fire because of his ability and also misses. It's the blind shooting the blind. Thankfully, DJ lands his shot for a big five damage, and we've sent the Warlock packing. I kind of like that it was the guy who was mind controlled who got the last shot on the Warlock. It's a nice touch. There is one faceless left, but we take it down without issue. And given how dire things look there, we've bounced back nicely in this mission. We get a couple more promotions, and now that we've got some sergeants, we can deploy five soldiers on missions. Well, at least we will be able to when we have enough supplies to buy the upgrade. And that's the downside of recruiting rookies. You have to spend supplies to do it. We have a covert op that will reward us with our rifles doing plus one damage. Given specialists can only use rifles, this will be really helpful, and I send Drifter out. The scheduled supply drop also lets us buy squad size one, so now we've got five soldiers and we're doing one extra point of damage with all five of them. So that's pretty good. Needless to say, the next couple of missions go off without a hitch. But before too long, the Hunter makes his debut. And you know how I've spent the last couple of videos making fun of the Hunter, since we keep absolutely destroying him time and time again? Well, I think he heard me, and I think I made him mad. Because he is not playing around on this one. We have to rescue a VIP, and we cluster the soldiers near the civilian. We briefly travel out to the fire exit of the building, but there's enough advent and lost out there that we quickly retreat back inside. I'm hoping that they'll finish each other off and we won't have to deal with them. Some loss do annoy us, but we're able to hold them off. But all the while, the hunter is gradually moving in closer to us. And here, things go really wrong. A sectoid and mech enter the building from one side, while the hunter enters from the other. We're surrounded, and the hunter dazes three of our soldiers with his gas grenade. Oh, and some dashes show up just to add to the fun. We revive the dazed soldiers and take out the two lost. I then throw a grenade at the mech. It's not enough to destroy it, but it does destroy the floor, and the mech goes plummeting. I send Hoffman down to finish it and of course she activates more Lost in the process. She thankfully takes down the mech, and Drifter finishes the sectoid. I protect Hoffman with aid protocol, as she is in a fairly precarious situation. Now the Hunter thankfully attacks the Lost, and not us, and he doesn't seem to benefit from the headshot ability. He leaves one of the Lost a smoking corpse, but still doesn't get another action. I'm not complaining about it, but it was unexpected. 
Now the lost are really starting to overrun things. I'm careful to use a grenade on the hunter, knocking him to street level below without blowing up the ladder, as Hoffman does need it to climb back up. But I actually decide against sending her up, as she won't be able to see the hunter from there, even though he's literally just below her. So I instead place her at the base of the ladder, and we miss an 87% chance shot. Seriously, what is going on in this campaign? This is not how probability is supposed to work. So I end up sending a couple more soldiers down to the road to take out the hunter. We succeed, but we still have a legion of lost to deal with. We thankfully only take one HP of damage from them, and then immediately scramble the squad back up any ladders we can find to try and escape the lost. We then push on to the evac zone, and I have to say, the imagery here is pretty great. Having a small squad hiding atop some storage containers while an ocean of zombies swirls around them is pretty awesome. Now it's a balance between thinning the Lost's numbers and still progressing towards the evac zone, but we make it there eventually. We have a covert op to reduce Avatar Project progress, and I have to say, even though this campaign isn't going brilliantly, I really love having a surplus of soldiers to send on covert ops. Now time marches on, as it always does, and we have another Haven defense mission. By this point mutons are spawning, but we do have mag weapons which are dealing good damage with our plus one buff we got earlier. And in this mission we have some absolute nonsense. So we're dealing with this muton and mech, incredibly easy missed shot aside, look at this. The surface of this captured UFO is basically flat, and yet we can get no line of sight on the mech. Like, look at this, how can we not see that thing? So I reload the game, as this has got to be a glitch. I don't consider this breaking my honest man rule. So we try again, and same thing. How are you going to tell me that man cannot see that massive robot? I wasn't even using the preview line of sight ability, as it just seemed like a no-brainer that we would have line of sight on the giant mech right in front of us. So we reload again, and this time we're able to get line of sight. I have absolutely no idea what happened there, but it was really dumb. So once we're done with that nonsense, we take out the rest of the advent forces and save the region. I will note here that I purchased skull mining from the proving grounds, I normally don't bother in these challenge runs, as we only use the Skulljack twice for story progression purposes, but in addition to letting you Skulljack one regular human enemy per mission, it does improve hacking, which is one of our specialists, well, specialties. So having a dedicated hacker equipped with a Skulljack isn't a bad idea. In this run, I've made DJ the hacker, Anytime there's a useful covert op with a reward to improve the soldier's hacking stat, I'm sending DJ out on it. And this links to a broader strategy you may want to adopt in your own campaigns. Keep those covert op rewards in mind. If you've got a sniper, you may want to always send them on the covert op that gives an aim bonus reward. Same thing with a ranger or templar on ops that provide a movement bonus. If you stack these on a soldier, you can end up having some really powerful units by the end of the campaign. I remember I once had a ranger who had nearly the same amount of HP as a sector pod. Those were some good times. But getting back to this campaign, the next guerrilla op is pretty wild. Starting out, we have some more line of sight shenanigans, with Leeson not being able to see this pod even though it seems like he really should be able to. But I'm aware of it now, and I'm checking the tile before I move, so we don't fall into the same trap as last time. We detonate the explosive container next to these guys and leave them with almost no HP. It's then easy to mop them up. Even better, DJ gets a hack reward that grants him concealment again. A faceless appears as the alien infiltrator dark event is active. We take it down easily and then send DJ ahead to scout. However, some sectoids flank us and our concealment is immediately gone again. So it was nice for the two seconds that it lasted, whatever. A pod above us that shouldn't have any line of sight on us somehow also activates at the same time. So we've got enemies to the front and to the right. And when I move Cat forward, the field commander, as well as another trooper and mech also activate. So I believe now that's technically four pods that we've just activated 
all at once. Cat is thankfully able to hack the mech and shut it down. Leeson one-shots the sectoid, and Drifter finishes a trooper with combat protocol. As he does so, another faceless activates. So I think that's five pods now. Oh, and we're out of actions. Sectoid 1 raises a zombie. His buddy hits a mind spin on Hoffman. It thankfully only panics her rather than a mind control. The field commander then hits both DJ and Leeson with a flashbang. So that's three out of five soldiers who have effectively been incapacitated. DJ and Leeson try to fire through their blindness and take out the faceless. Needless to say, they're unable to do so. Cat one-shots the mech with combat protocol. Now this attack does double damage to robotic enemies, and we've upgraded our gremlins to Mark II, which is why the attack is so lethal. Now, usually the Gremlin Mark II deals a base damage of 4, at least I think it does. But for some reason, ours are doing 5. I'm not sure if it's because of the plus 1 weapon damage that we unlocked earlier, that's also being applied to the Gremlin for some reason, or if it's something else entirely. But I shouldn't question it, and instead we should just take the win. Though I do feel silly now for not just using Combat Protocol last turn, we could really use an extra attack at this point. Drifter uses another combat protocol to finish the faceless, but it's now Advent's turn to hit back. One of the sectoids panics Drifter. In his panic, he shoots at the zombie and takes it out, so that's not a terrible outcome. The other sectoid shoots Leeson for good damage. Thankfully, the field commander starts retreating to the evac zone rather than attacking, if he had also targeted Leeson, we'd probably have another casualty on our hands right about now. I did get a glimpse of the commander going into Overwatch, so I use aid protocol on Cat to boost her defense, but it doesn't help and she still takes damage from the Overwatch. I pursue the commander with Leeson and DJ, while Hoffman stays back to protect Drifter with aid protocol. Part of the plan works, as the sectoids use both their actions moving in on Drifter rather than attacking. He was hunkering down from the panic, so their chance to hit him must have been quite low. However, the commander decides that he actually doesn't care about evacing anymore, and is instead going to come back to destroy us. He fires at Leeson, but thankfully misses. Leeson hits back with combat protocol and takes out the commander, and again, I'm feeling pretty silly as I could have just done that last turn. Hoffman and Drifter then each one-shot the sectoids, and we've somehow come out of that nightmare with no casualties. And I didn't even handle it very well. But again, it's a win, so let's take it and move on. Soon enough, we've got another guerrilla op, and there's a dark event that stops us from having concealment on every single mission. We definitely want to stop that one. We begin the mission by going beast mode with Cat. Her blue screen rounds allow her to one shot the mech in the first pod, and her hair trigger activates, giving her another action. We use this to hack and disable the turret, and that was a pretty awesome start to the mission. We skulljack the captain, but the codex spawns on the other side of the train, out of line of sight. We haven't been able to take out the purifier either, but we have a mimic beacon, so it's all good. But just like that annoying Andromedon from the last video, the Purifier ignores the Mimic Beacon and instead retreats. As if this wasn't annoying enough, he activates another pod in the process. The Codex also activates, and the turret will come back next turn, so we've got six active enemies. Not great, but hopefully our specialists can handle it. We're only able to eliminate one Sectoid and the turret, though we do damage the Codex and Spectre. The Spectre then clones DJ while the Sectoid raises a zombie, and the Codex hits both Metla and Failed with a psionic bomb. Oh, and then Advent calls in reinforcements. They are really not pulling any punches in this mission. Now, the Spectre probably thought it was being clever by taking cover on the roof, but it's given Cat clear line of sight for combat protocol, which we promptly use. This gives us back control of DJ, and something a little weird has happened here. See, DJ was in the area of effect for the psionic bomb, but his gun didn't jam, so he doesn't have to reload. I have no idea 
how the person holding the gun being unconscious would stop the gun from jamming, but again, let's just take the win. DJ finishes off the codex, and that ends well for us. Chan is able to one-shot the sectoid, but she does activate a turret at the same time. The turrets don't seem to have great accuracy, so hopefully we'll be alright, but I do use an aid protocol on her just to help her chances a little bit more. The reinforcements drop down, and Chan avoids the turret shot. We clean up the reinforcements and the turret, regroup, and head to the objective. We do encounter another pod near the device we have to hack, and it has a muton. We're not able to eliminate any of the four soldiers, but we do disorientate all of them with a flashbang. But even disorientated, this trooper hits DJ through full cover. I hate to think what the probability of making that shot was, but I bet it wasn't very high. Even more annoying, the shield bearer can still activate its shield for the whole squad through the disorientation. We do have plasma grenades by now, so DJ is able to hit the shield bearer and the car it's taking cover on for big damage. One more shot takes care of the shield bearer, and now all the pod shields are down. This lets us take out the muton with combat protocol, but the remaining trooper and purifier survive. The trooper throws a grenade at two of our soldiers, but it somehow misses both of them, and we take no damage. I thought a grenade could only miss if you had an ability like parry active, but apparently that's not the case. So that's bad luck for Advent, I guess. The purifier sets Metler alight, but all things considered, we got off pretty lightly there. We mop up the enemies, hack the objective, and call it a day. At this point, we purchase both squad size 2 and cool under pressure, which gives our specialists an aim buff when overwatching, and allows overwatch shots to critically hit. Now you may have noticed Drifter hasn't been on too many missions. While I'd love to say this is because I don't want these videos to be ego driven with my own character taking the spotlight, it's actually the opposite. I've been sending Drifter out on Covert Ops to boost his aim so that he becomes one of the most powerful units we have. And yeah, I know, it's a bit conceited, but that's what we love about video games, isn't it? Being able to make versions of ourselves and watch as they kick a whole lot of butt. Well, I hope you can forgive my self-indulgence here, and hopefully it doesn't affect your enjoyment of the video. Now, I acquire a superior scope and give it to Drifter to bolster his already quite good aim, but here's the really good part. We've constructed the training center by now. Our hero classes got access to their random ability straight away, but with regular classes, you have to build the training center first. And Drifter has the very ability that he needs to wreak absolute destruction on Advent. Death from above. Basically, if you eliminate an enemy from a higher elevation, it refunds an action point. And I think these random abilities are maybe one of the more underappreciated aspects of War of the Chosen. You didn't get these in the base game, and they can make things really interesting. Now the avatar progress has filled, so we opt for a facility sabotage mission. We've also unlocked predator armor by this point, so Chan is rocking an exosuit. There is an alien ruler on this mission, but we'll actually be able to make use of the armor it gives us in this run, so I don't mind facing it. I mean, it's easy to say that now, before we've actually had to face it. So we start surrounded by three pods and a turret, giving us seven enemies total. But we have the high ground, and the specialists have been doing pretty well on the tactical layer, so I decide to just launch an attack and activate everyone at once. We have two mimic beacons if things go wrong, so first shot and pyrotechnic inflicts a crit with 17 damage on the codex. That is the power of blue screen rounds. The second attack is less impressive, however. Failed shoots the Viper. It survives with 1 HP, but we blow out the floor beneath Pyrotechnic, and he takes fall damage. Not our finest moment, but not a disaster either. Drifter one-shots the Sectoid and then weakens the Muton. I don't know why I even attack with Drifter here. He has death from above, so I should be using him to mop up already weakened enemies, so we can just keep shooting indefinitely. I'm not sure what I was thinking there. 
After a miss with DJ, I use both Mimic Beacons as there's still quite a few enemies left on the field. On the next turn, I use a Heavy Rocket to one-shot the turret. I also move our units to the ground in order to blow up the fuel tank, or maybe it's a gas tank, next to the Muton. Both these moves were really bad plays. We could have easily stayed on the roof and used Death from Above to mop up all those enemies without using any Mimic Beacons or Rockets. I must admit, watching this footage back, it's actually pretty frustrating watching me play so badly. And just after I spent all that time in the video hyping up Death from Above too. This does hurt a little bit, I must admit. Well, we still survive without taking any damage, so I guess I shouldn't complain too much. We overwatch creep forward, keeping our soldiers spread out a bit. The rulers do have AoE attacks, so never cluster your troops close together when you're facing them. The Berserker Queen then shows up. I was really hoping it would be the Viper King. We inflict 16 damage on her with Overwatch Fire, which is honestly not that great, given our specialists are meant to be really good at Overwatch. She attacks and failed is knocked unconscious, while Pyrotechnic is stunned. I guess I didn't spread the troops out as much as I thought I did. She escapes with 53 health, which is pretty bad, as it could take another two encounters before we finish her. Now, of course, Failed is the dedicated medic with Revival Protocol, so if the Queen had knocked out literally anyone else, he could have revived them. But he obviously can't revive himself, so some pretty lousy luck right there. We pick up Failed's unconscious body, and we're basically down to four troops now. Failed can't attack, nor can the person carrying him. We then stumble into another pod. We take out a stun lancer, but can't finish any of the other three soldiers. And the priest does the worst thing it can possibly do, and hits us with a mind control. So Drifter, my main man, is now working for the enemy. Ouch. And the shield bearer has activated its ability, making the priest even bulkier, and harder for us to take out to get Drifter back. So we're now down to three soldiers. We use aid protocol with Chan, as she's now flanked by Drifter, and then hit the shield bearer with combat protocol. But when I was playing, I wasn't really paying attention, and I thought I had finished the shield bearer when I hadn't. So you're about to see that blow up in my face. DJ is able to one-shot the trooper with Skullmine, but of course we take feedback damage. In retrospect, using Skullmine on the Priest would have been an infinitely better idea. Oh well, nothing can be done about that now. Pyrotechnic puts Fail down so he can attack, but he only has Line of Sight on Drifter, so we really don't want him to attack. He can at least use Aid Protocol on Cat, which is better than a punch in the face, I guess. Chan goes down to Stasis, and Drifter finishes DJ. Yep, I'm a cold-blooded killer, ladies and gents. DJ was our hacker too, so losing him is quite the pain. All those aim buffs I gave to Drifter are really coming back to bite me right now. Pyrotechnic and Cat are the only soldiers we have available, and they can't finish the priest between them. Pyrotechnic then goes down to combined firepower from the priest and shield bearer. Drifter hits Chan for big damage, but she thankfully survives. But yeah, we've now lost two soldiers on this mission. This is catastrophic. I send Cat in to finish the priest at point blank range, and she misses. Chan thankfully hits, but it goes into stasis. Thankfully, Drifter is back on our side by now, and he takes out the shield bearer. The priest lands a mind control on Cat, but it only has one HP left so we take him out before any more damage can be done. We have three healthy soldiers left, enough to pick up the three bodies to take them home. Well, Failed is still alive, but you get my point. So we plant the X4 and evac out, and what an utter disaster of a mission. I mean, I started off with some bad plays, then we got some bad luck with the Berserker Queen knocking out Failed, the one guy who was able to revive the unconscious, then the priest using mind control instead of stasis, which is what it normally does. Just a series of unfortunate events leading to an absolute massacre and us losing two of our most powerful soldiers. Now, after that disaster, we literally get a council mission immediately. 
This is just cruel at this point. Also, there's only seven enemies according to the Shadow Chamber, so that almost certainly means a Chosen is going to show up. I send mostly lower level troops, mainly because that's all we can spare. We have to assassinate the enemy VIP, but we're kind of lucky that the roof with the evac zone also has a view of the VIP. My plan is to keep concealment until we're in position and then try to take out the VIP and run away before the assassin can chase us down. Of course, because we're remaining in concealment, the pods start closing in on us. This is intended behavior by the devs, though I really don't like it. Of course we get spotted, and now we've got two pods active on the roof with us. I devise a bit of a risky plan. See, Paul Green can get a combat protocol off on the VIP, but he has to run a heavy mech overwatch to get to the evac zone first. So I use aid protocol to protect him, and then move him the one square he needs to be in the evac zone, and it actually works. The mech misses and we avoid the overwatch, but sadly, moving him this one square has made him lose line of sight on the VIP somehow. So I thought it was a cool idea, but it turns out it was actually a pretty rubbish one. So that means we have to fight. And when I say fight, I mean throw down a bunch of mimic beacons to use as a distraction while we target the VIP and then run away like a bunch of cowards. We have three Mimic Beacons by this point, so the plan works quite well, and we're long gone before the Assassin can get anywhere near us. But then we get a miracle, my friends. Remember earlier how I told you about that glitch that was giving us double-ups of characters in the Recruit section? Well, we have some clones of DJ and Pyrotechnic. I immediately recruit them, and it's like they never left. They are rookies again, so we'll have to retrain them, but I'm happy to have the boys back on the team all the same. Now, I do have a confession that I have to make here. I did something, a couple of times actually, accidentally. I sent a rookie out on a covert op. I don't like to do this because A, if you get ambushed, you're now using a rookie in combat, which is against the rules. B, they will level up and get a promotion, they may not become a specialist or whatever class you're using for the run, meaning you can't use them at all for the rest of the campaign. And C, it just feels like it goes against the spirit of the challenge. We're meant to be only relying on specialists, so that's all that I want to use. Now this was a genuine accident, so I hope you can forgive me for it. So the next mission is a bit out there too. It's a guerrilla op, and we need to destroy the device to stop an avatar progress breakthrough from occurring. So this one is an important one to stop. The device is in a building. I drop an evac zone right next to the window, figuring I can shoot the device and then bail out if we're getting overwhelmed. There's actually a sit rep on this mission letting us only send low level troops. So it's quite likely that we are going to get overwhelmed. Of course, my plan won't work if the Berserker Queen shows up, as she'll be able to attack us before we can evac. So we take one shot at the device, but this of course causes the Queen to charge in. So we need a way of destroying the device through the window without actually looking through the window and letting the Queen see us. She can't use her reaction turns if she doesn't have line of sight. I was thinking this was a lost cause, until I realized the explosive tank next to the building. I lob a grenade through the window at an angle the queen can't see us, it causes the tank to explode, and the device is caught in the blast radius. We then evac out in what may be the craziest victory I've ever had in this game. I mean, we don't get the reward because we didn't finish off all the enemies, but we stopped the dark event, and that's the main thing that matters. Now this was a pretty rotten move by the game, only letting me send low level soldiers while also deploying the Berserker Queen against us. It makes me extra happy that we were able to pull off this ridiculous strategy. We unlock powered armor, which is pretty nuts since we haven't even done the black site yet. So we've got a couple of war suits to play with now too. Also, Neam Leeson has been promoted to the A-Team 
due to DJ and pyrotechnic going back to rookie level. God help us all. So we hit the Warlock's base. I want to take this guy out before we hit the black site, so we don't have to worry about him showing up and mind controlling everyone. The first pod wanders into an Overwatch ambush, and given our specialists can fire multiple Overwatch shots by this point, we do big damage despite not actually taking anyone out. We clean up the pod with ease and move on to the next, which features a Berserker. Now here, Drifter finally gets to show off Death from Above. He has blue screen rounds, and because his aim is so high, he's got 100% chance to hit, which means the Codexes can't dodge. So the Codexes are now a guaranteed one shot, and he takes all three of them down by himself. I told you this was a good ability to have. Needless to say, this pod doesn't give us any problems either. The pod at the elevator I handle pretty badly. I just start shooting without much idea of what I'm doing. Like take this captain, I shoot at it twice and then detonate the explosive next to it. I should have gone after the explosive first to get the shred and then started shooting. That would have allowed us to take it out, which would have saved our mimic beacon one attack, which would have saved failed from getting hit by the stun lancer. But whatever, it can't be helped now. We finish the pod on the next turn, heal failed, and then head down to see the Warlock. I hope this goes well. An Archon and Codex are waiting for us in the chamber, but they get overwatched into oblivion. Overwatch creep is a great strategy when you've got a team of specialists with abilities that enhance their overwatch. We spread the team out, then in comes the man with the skullet. I start things off with a plasma blaster, thinking it will shred his armor, but it doesn't actually shred. So a grenade with cat does, and it also destroys his cover. We then unleash with as much firepower as we can, but he hangs on with 3 HP. He then summons in two stun lancers and three spectral stun lancers, so that's five enemies he's brought in on one turn. But I'll still take that over a mind control. I figure we can't take out all five enemies, so I meant to use the mimic beacon with Chan, but I stupidly fired with her instead. So Advent get to attack us back, which is not good. Cat takes some damage and Failed gets dazed. Again, Failed is the one who can heal other soldiers, so it's especially annoying when he gets a status problem. However, I did take Mettler on this mission too, who have also specialized as a medic. Now, here I do something that might seem a bit weird. I throw down the Mimic Beacon and then end my turn early. I figure while the Warlock is in stasis, he's harmless. This way we can finish him quickly next turn and focus a bunch of firepower on the sarcophagus straight away before any reinforcements come in. This will let us take it out as fast as possible. However, between rolling low damage against the Stun Lancer and having to heal soldiers, my plan doesn't really work that well. We do still take out the Warlock, but it takes quite a few actions to do it. Thanks to Death from Above, we take out the reinforcements and are then able to just destroy the sarcophagus. This is good, as the Warlock then warps back in with only 50% health. Now something weird happens here. I use the blaster bomb to shred the Warlock, but it actually still hurts him as well. So I guess it's only explosions from grenades that he's immune to? I don't really understand, but whatever, it's good for us. Needless to say, we win. And the best part is that we'll actually be able to use the Warlock's rifle once we've researched it. It's a really good weapon, so I'm looking forward to that. A supply raid is up next, and we meet a sector pod in battle. This is a bit ridiculous. We're encountering sector pods on normal missions, and I haven't even done the black site yet. We are able to take care of the sector pod before it can harm us, but its mech buddy does get some missiles off. I don't even feel bad for these guys, to be honest. Look at them trying to hit this heavy mech. It is a sight that would be funny if it weren't so sad. Like, just imagine being some civilian watching these guys thinking our entire planet depends on these morons. They don't even have eyes. Surely you would be consumed with despair. I know I would. But having sectopods on the field means we can research Mark III Gremlins, which will give our specialists a nice boost. 
So having Drifter equipped with the Warlock's rifle, as well as blue screen rounds, and beam weapons on the whole squad, we finally set out on the Black Sight mission. I really just didn't want the Warlock showing up on this one. He can hang out behind the main building and really cause big problems for your squad with his Psy attacks. Also, the second coming of DJ is with us for this mission, which I like to see. Now, the dark event that removes our concealment is active, so there's no cover for us. That's a slight problem, but it shouldn't be too bad. So we come across a codex and skull jacket. And I have to ask, how many times have you beaten the Avatar on the Black Sight mission? I'm pretty sure this is a first for me. And it was here, my good people, that I learnt the hard way that the Mimic Beacon does not work on the Avatar. I mean, it's a boss type enemy, so it makes sense that it doesn't work, but I didn't actually know that. Or maybe I did know, but I just forgot. So our most dangerous soldier, Drifter, gets mind controlled. We've also activated another pod, so things aren't looking too good here. I decide not to play around and hit the avatar with our blaster bomb. It does monumental damage, as well as taking out that entire section of the building. I love these things. It takes a few shots, but we defeat the avatar and distract the pod with a mimic beacon. Metler even takes out one of the sectoids with an overwatch. However, another pod appears with a heavy mech on Overwatch. Now, Drifter hits the Codex with the Warlock's rifle. This rifle always critically hits psionic enemies. Now, since the Codex is both psionic, meaning we get a crit, and robotic, meaning we do double damage, we hit this thing for 17 damage. Massive. DJ misses a 93% shot that would have ended the mech, and I'm immediately less excited about having him back on the team. We're still able to finish the mech and burn through our final Mimic Beacon to distract the remaining soldiers. We have revealed a turret that overwatches, but a Haywire protocol shuts it down, so we can press forward and take out the remaining Advent soldiers. We take out the turret as well, and storm the main building, wiping out the pod unfortunate enough to be in our way. Finally, we have two Mutons, a Spectre, and a turret to get through. We are out of Mimic Beacons at this point, so this could be a problem. My plan is to soften up the enemies with our squad so Drifter can finish them off. Well, the plan works fine on the first Muton, but with the second one, we hit it with Metler's Plasma Blaster, which also damages the building, and somehow this causes Chan and Drifter to lose sight of the Muton. I have no idea how that makes any sense whatsoever, but okay, we'll roll with it. We take out the turret, but the Muton will get to hit us back, so I just spread the team out as much as I can to avoid it lobbing a grenade our way. Thankfully the Muton can't get close enough to attack us, and we finish it off. We've lost track of the Spectre, so all I can do is grab the vial and push on. I realised too late that I could have used a scanning protocol to reveal it, but such is life. It doesn't cause us any problems anyway, as we run past it and the reinforcements back to the Sky Ranger. We then have a council mission to rescue a VIP, and you know who we haven't seen in a while? Our old friend, the Berserker Queen. Well, she's back from outer space on this one, and the high-level soldiers are tired from the black site, so we've got a fair few lower-level meat shields, sorry, I mean troops, on our squad. The first pod sees a Codex, Stun Lancer, and Purifier, Acostus. Only the Purifier survives, which we shut down completely with a flashbang. However, then Mama Berserker arrives, and she's got three Muton buddies with her. Leeson starts off by missing against one of the Mutons. My plan is to use up all the action points of the people the Queen doesn't have line of sight on. This will mean when she charges forward, they'll have already had their turn and won't be giving her any unnecessary reaction turns. However, the Queen still gets to attack us once, and that's all she needs. Ulrich gets dazed, and Boruto, no, he's not Naruto's son, gets knocked unconscious. Prepare yourselves, people. I have a bad feeling about this one. Thankfully, we did get to throw down a Mimic Beacon, which keeps the rest of the enemies off our back, but this is going to get brutal. I have no choice but to start firing, knowing we're going to get hit hard. 
Well, the second attack on Ulrich thankfully misses, but Hoffman then gets knocked unconscious too. We're now down to four soldiers. Leeson also gets hit, and the Queen then attempts to panic our squad, but they thankfully all resist. Another Mimic Beacon distracts the Mutons, and then, on our next turn, we finally inflict enough damage that the Queen decides to flee. I let her escape, instead focusing on the Mutons, as they'll still be able to attack us next turn. Oh, also, want to know a fun fact? The two soldiers knocked out were the two soldiers with Revival Protocol. What on earth? Does the AI deliberately target soldiers with Revival Protocol for attacks that may cause a knockout? Or am I just getting really bad luck? I mean, how would the aliens even know whose gremlins are outfitted with which abilities? This was quite frustrating, I must admit. We're thankfully able to finish off the Mutons before they can hit us, and I push on very quickly. I'm hoping we can get the VIP, race back to our unconscious allies, grab them, and book it back to the evac zone before the turn timer runs out. Hey, I said I'm hopeful, not realistic. Waiting for us inside is a mech and three advent troopers, including the purifier who escaped earlier. With only four soldiers, we simply don't have the firepower we need to take all our enemies out. The stun lancer stuns green, thankfully only for one action, not two, and the purifier tries to burn us, but is only able to hit green. Yeah, he's not having a great turn. We're able to finish the pot on the next turn, but I decide at this point it's too risky to go back for our unconscious allies. There's just too much distance to cover, and not enough time to cover it. And this turns out to be the right decision, as Advent then drops in reinforcements. We evac with the VIP, and while that went terribly, given the Berserker Queen's presence, it actually could have gone much worse. I mean, it's pretty garbage that the two people who were knocked out are the same two people with Revival Protocol, but whatever, it's in the past. If they can't even stay awake on the battlefield, they probably weren't the best soldiers in the world anyway. And while the Queen did escape, she has very little HP left, so on our next encounter, we should be able to take her out relatively easily. But hey... When it rains, it pours. Before we've even finished licking our wounds, the Hunter UFO finds us. We're one hour away from having Cat and Metler, both who are major level, return from a covert op too. But we're gonna have to do this one without them. And this bad luck is honestly killing me at this point. But you know what? We're not going to quit. If this game wants to do the dirty on us, we'll do it dirty right back. Prepare for Hellfire Advent. You're about to have a very bad day. We build Mark III Gremlins and then head out. Normal rules here. We're not allowed to use the turrets as they obviously aren't specialists. Bradford immediately sends us some reinforcements in the form of Pyrotechnic. He's a squatty and has no useful abilities whatsoever. Excellent. His return wasn't quite as impressive as DJ's. Sorry about that one, buddy. As Advent begin to swarm us, we deploy the Blaster Launcher. We can only hit the Andromedon, but we destroy some cover that Advent was using at the same time. And check out Pyrotechnic's chance to hit. 39%. Brutal. He misses, of course. We mop up a couple of soldiers, thanks to death from above. Now here, Drifter is the only one left with any shots. I decide just to shoot the Priest, because why not? Well, we actually get a hair trigger activation and we can shoot again. Two is enough to take the priest out, so then death from above activates and we can shoot again, damaging the shield bearer. That may literally have been a lifesaver. Another pod activates and, just like the last run, the Andromedon ignores the Mimic Beacon. Brutal. Wait, did I say another pod? No, no, we activate two more pods. Now there's really no way we're going to be able to take out all these enemies. We do get the Andromedon and we flashbang a good chunk of Advent Soldiers, but the counter-attack is now coming. And what a counter-attack it's surely to be. Or not? The Archon flies around in a circle for some reason, and the only actual attack comes from a Stun Lancer which misses. 
The shield bearer did activate its shield, but it has very little HP left, so we should be able to take it out on our turn, and that's exactly what we do. And then through absolute abuse of death from above, we actually take out all the remaining enemies. The only one that holds on is the priest because of sustain. It doesn't attack, instead just trying to rush the Avenger. Well priest, I wish you and your 1 HP good luck with that endeavour. You're gonna need it. However, reinforcements are on the way, so we make a beeline for the Disruptor with a couple of soldiers while overwatching with the rest. Well, a Captain and Stun Lancer drop down, and we actually wipe them both out with Overwatch. I move DJ as far from the Disruptor as possible, while still having line of sight on it. I did this purely because it would mean he'd have less ground to cover on the way back to the Avenger, but it actually served another purpose. See, I get a glimpse of another pod behind the Disruptor. If we had moved in any closer, we probably would have activated it. After the Disruptor is destroyed, a heavy mech drops in as a reinforcement. This is actually quite annoying as it goes into Overwatch, which means none of our Overwatch shots activate against it. I did purchase an Overdrive Serum, so I load that up on Chan, and she runs the Overwatch Gauntlet. I could have just shot the mech to remove the Overwatch, but whoever shot then wouldn't have been able to move this turn, and I'm trying frantically to get back to the Avenger as quickly as possible. Chan does get hit, but the damage is minimal thanks to the overdrive. Once the mech is gone, we double time it back to the ship, and everyone thankfully makes it out alive. Well, that actually went much better than I expected it to. But the game is then even more horrible to us, immediately hitting us with a gorilla op. I decide to ignore it and instead heal up at Templar HQ. Once the A-Team has recovered, we embark for the Hunter's base. Now things don't go so great as we activate a pod of Chrysalids and another pod of Advent Soldiers at the same time. We take out the Chrysalids and use a Mimic Beacon to distract the Soldiers. Now thankfully by this point we have the Tactical Analysis Continental Bonus and it really saves our hides here. The Priest and the Stun Lancer attack the Mimic Beacon, destroying it. Because of tactical analysis, the Purifier can only move up towards us. It can't attack. And the Shield Bearer just uses its shield, so we've made it through the turn without taking any hits, but we've still got this second pod to deal with. And so, behold the power of Skullmine. Cat one-shots that Shield Bearer through a shield, armor, and full HP and she gets us some extra intel for her troubles. You've got to love that. And now the rest of the pod loses their shields, leaving them vulnerable. We take out the Stun Lancer, but it immediately resurrects as a zombie. This is because of another rubbish dark event that we picked up. I guess that's what happens when you skip Gorilla Ops. Well, we're still able to take the pod down, except for the Priest, who falls back into the next room. In the next room, the Priest has found an Andromedon and Purifier for backup. We take the Purifier out, but Cat misses a shot on the Priest, and because of yet another horrible dark event we have active, the Priest gets to shoot back, and he doesn't miss, so Cat takes damage. Thankfully the Mimic Beacon saves us on the enemy turn, the Andromedon then goes down, but the Priest survives again because of sustain. And with its turn, what do you think it did? Yeah, that's right, it ran away again. But this time we catch him before he can find another pod and take him out. Only for it to rise as a zombie straight away. This priest just doesn't want to go down. We shoot at it again, and after finishing it three times, it finally stays down. The last pod gives us more chrysalids that don't pose any issue, and we ride the elevator down into the depths, where we meet a Stun Lancer and Andromedon. Thanks to a capacitor discharge, we disorientate the Andromedon. We also take out the Stun Lancer. The Andromedon still manages to hit Drifter, and it does huge damage, in addition to shredding a point of armor. That was not good. And now for something really dumb. Cat misses an 82% shot, but that's not the dumb part. No, no, she has a fear of missed shots and panics. In her panic, she shoots again at the Andromedon, and this time she hits it. Way to make a production out of that. 
We use Restoration with Failed. This heals every soldier on the team, but is limited to one use per mission. So both Cat and Drifter are healed. It removes Cat's Panic and gives her two actions back, even though she's already used them this turn. I never realized Restoration did this, and I'm thinking about AoE panic attacks, like what the Berserker Queen tried to use on us earlier. There's some potential there for really exploiting the game, I think. So we lure out the Hunter and immediately shred him with the Blaster Bomb. He does have the Planewalker ability, again, so he teleports around every time we hit him. The good thing here is that when he does teleport into a difficult to hit position, we can always get him with a combat protocol. Metla misses a 95% shot, because that's XCOM baby, and that may have made the difference between us defeating the Hunter this turn and not. Now two things are interesting here, at least I think they are. One is that the Hunter has kinetic shielding, so gain shield points after a missed attack. Drifter's rifle though appears to ignore the shield points completely, I have no idea why. Secondly, Drifter's rifle doesn't critically hit, so the Hunter isn't classed as a psionic enemy, despite having obvious psionic abilities like Planewalker. Kinda weird. He summons in two mechs and dazes Metla with his gas grenade. Thanks to blue screen rounds, we're able to easily take out the mechs. The Hunter doesn't have much HP left either, so he goes down without issue. But then the game decides it's had enough of us and throws in a heavy mech and an Andromedon as reinforcements. We take out the mech and get the Andromedon to its second form, but these health pools are just way too high for us to be able to beat both enemies completely. The worst part is we don't get any shots off against the sarcophagus. The next lot of reinforcements are a codex and captain, which is much better, but this is still really annoying. We avoid the Andromedon's punch, and then Drifter goes to town, taking out the codex and Andromedon. The captain is in full cover, and Cat misses her shot. The captain gets to fire back and hits us, of course. We do eliminate the captain, and we can at least fire a few shots at the sarcophagus this turn, but we can't destroy it. So that means the hunter is back with 100% health. He has his armor back too, and I think we're out of explosives at this point. We get him to roughly half health when it's his turn to hit back. He summons yet more mechs, and then dazes both Cat and Failed with his stun grenade. However, once again, we have a medic in Metla who can remotely heal Failed's days. <laughs> then I do something really dumb. Drifter has one shot left in his clip, and instead of reloading, I reposition. This means he can't make use of death from above this turn. We're still able to take out the mechs thanks to combat protocol, but between the dazes and the bad plays, we get no damage off on the hunter. He fires at Cat, but thankfully misses despite her being flanked. That may have finished her off if it hit. On the next turn, we're finally able to take him out, but we still have the sarcophagus to deal with. More reinforcements in the form of a chrysalid and a captain. We take them out and are finally able to destroy the sarcophagus. Thank goodness. The hunter is back for a third round, but he only has 50% health this time. We're able to finish him this turn and the nightmare is finally over. Wow, that was brutal. I think the Planewalker ability made that much more difficult than it would have been otherwise. Well, that and getting the bad luck with IHP reinforcements early on. But either way, it's over now, and we've bought ourselves a reprieve. Soon the Avatar progress bar fills, and I send the squad out to the forge to bring it back down. Seeing as the hunter has been wiped out, he thankfully won't be present on this one. Also, Drifter is injured, so no death from above for us on this mission. We dispose of the first pot easily, but this purifier, you have to admire him. He gets blown up and dropped through the ceiling and still manages to come back as a zombie. I mean, this guy is a hunk of smoldering flesh with two broken legs, but he's not going to let that stop him from fulfilling his duty. I quite admire this guy. Okay, enough admiration. Take him down. 
And then we're met with quite the surprise as the sector pod is on our side of the bridge. I have had this thing wander off in the past, but it usually goes behind the main building. I don't think I've ever seen it come across the bridge in my dozens, if not hundreds, of campaigns of this game. Even though we're caught off guard, we still destroy it without too much issue, we're able to shred with the blaster launcher, and then between both blue screen rounds and combat protocol inflicting double damage, it goes down easily enough. Next up is an Andromedon and Shield Bearer. Thanks to a Plasma Blaster, we're able to take down the Andromedon. I could use the Mimic Beacon on the Shield Bearer, but I figure he'll just use his shield anyway, so he's not really a threat. Well, he decides not to use his shield, and instead shoot Cat right in the chest. I don't think I've ever seen a Shield Bearer shoot over using its shield, but I guess I don't usually have soldiers out of cover either, so maybe that was the difference. Needless to say, he doesn't live long after that. We enter the main building and have a mech and some soldiers to deal with. Now Cat one-shots the Stun Lancer with Skullmine, which is good, but she also takes feedback damage, which is bad. She's not having a great mission here. And the Stun Lancer revives as a zombie, which is really bad, as it's right next to Cat. Fayord actually misses an 87% shot here, but he has a stock, so is able to finish off the damaged zombie all the same. The Purifier survives, but that's what the Mimic Beacon is for. But things don't go to plan. The Purifier attacks the Mimic Beacon with its Flamethrower. Cat is too close and gets caught in the blast, taking even more damage. She's really not having a good mission here. There's not much else to say though, we run into an Andromedon and two Mutons. We try taking control of the Andromedon shell, only to fail miserably and have the Mutons attack us. Thankfully they both miss, and then we take them out. We then leg it to the evac zone, and it's mission success. And despite all the damage she took, Cat is only wounded for four days, so I'm pretty happy about that. Things are a bit of a mixed bag as we go forward. Some missions we stomp all over Advent, and some were forced to evac out of because we're so overwhelmed. But we don't take any casualties, and it's soon time to hit the Assassin's base. So Drifter has line of sight on this Andromedon, right? Then we destroy the pilot, taking it down to the shell. And now Drifter has somehow lost line of sight. I do not understand. And watch failed shoot right through the shield to end the shield bearer. I dig it. Not too much else to say on our way to the elevator. We use the skull mine on a priest. I just wanted to note here that skull mining priests can be a good move, as it's a guaranteed one shot if it connects. The priest won't be able to use sustain to cheat death. At least I don't think they can. So we head down the elevator, and I don't think we've actually had to use a mimic beacon yet. So this is going really well. We stomp through the enemies waiting for us in the chamber, and then in comes the assassin. She disappears, but I finally remember that we have scanning protocol, so we locate her immediately. We use a Shredstorm cannon to shred the assassin, damage her, and destroy her cover. Not a bad start. Failed then hits with holo targeting, which will make it easier for the rest of the team to hit her. And now it's go time. It may seem insane that I'm running our soldiers right up to her, but she has the brittle weakness, so going close range, close range means we're doing more damage. Valen would be proud. I ignore the reinforcements and focus fire on the sarcophagus. We've got the mimic beacons to distract the enemies, and we don't want to go three rounds with the assassin like we had to with the hunter. Now the sarcophagus has a lot of health, so we can't destroy it in one turn. This leads to four reinforcements being in the chamber with us at once. Not great, but I still choose to focus on the sarcophagus, and we destroy it in a couple of hits. So now we can deal with the bad guys. We're only able to take out one, but another Mimic Beacon saves us from the rest. Another scanning protocol reveals the assassin, and we then hit her with everything we have. I thought her full cover was indestructible, but turns out it's not. Not at all, in fact. So this just keeps on getting better. We again make use of Brittle, charging headlong at our opponent, and we annihilate her. The Chosen are no more, and that means we're reaching the end of the campaign. We get a Gorilla Op, 
and I'm wanting missions with vipers at this point so we can build more medikits. See, to build a regular medikit, it just costs supplies, but once you upgrade them to nano medikits, it requires viper corpses too. So make sure you build all the medikits you need before you upgrade them in the proving grounds, just in case you run out of corpses like I did. That's a weird thing to say. Anyway, one of the Gorilla Ops is going to allow us to finally rescue our boy Boruto, who I'm going to refer to as Monocle from now on. You can probably guess why. The mission goes off without a hitch, and our old buddy has rejoined the ranks. We then head out to the Gatekeeper mission, even though we've been encountering Gatekeepers on regular missions by this point. And Specialists aren't a terrible unit for this one. Having scanning protocol with the Gremlin on the majority of our troops means we should be able to detect the Chrysalids before they're a threat to us. We skulljack a trooper and activate a second pod in the process, so we've got two Archons, two Sectoids, and a Purifier to deal with. A Capacitor Discharge destroys a Sectoid and leaves an Archon disoriented, a Shredstorm Cannon deals more damage on the Archons and takes out the other Sectoid, our Mimic Beacon saves us on the alien turn, and we then unleash with firepower to take out the survivors. Scanning Protocol does a great job of luring out the hiding chrysalids, so we can smoke them too. And the radius on Scanning Protocol is mammoth. It's an awesome ability for this mission. Also, there's something really unsettling about watching chrysalids patrol back and forth after you've scanned them, it's just so ominous and creepy. We move up slow and steady, taking out the chrysalids as we go. There's really no other way to play this mission in my opinion. Well, not if you want your soldiers to survive at least. The gatekeeper appears, but by this point we've got enough firepower that we can take it out quite easily. But then the last remaining chrysalid totally ignores the mimic beacon and attacks failed. No idea why it did this. Does the Mimic Beacon not work on the lids? I honestly can't remember. Anyway, it soon goes down too, and oh, turns out that was only the second last Chrysalid. Well, the last one goes down easily enough also. And obviously, because we've already disposed of the Assassin, she didn't turn up on this mission. We continue on, and finally fight some Vipers, allowing us to take their corpses and build more Medikits. Still a weird sentence to say, isn't it? Like, imagine having to have the corpse of a giant killer snake just to be able to receive medical treatment. Is that a medical institution that you would trust? Oh well, XCOM is gonna XCOM. Not too long after, we gain improved beam weapons, so our guns will now be doing an extra point of damage. Not bad at all. So at this stage, I decide for a bit of a high risk, high reward strategy and deliberately attack one of the advent facilities housing an alien ruler. What can I say? I want to turn their hides into armor for the squad. Now I'm hoping to get the Viper King, but I once read in a Warhammer 40,000 rulebook that hope is the first step on the road to disappointment. And that nihilistic thinking turns out to be right in this case as we get the Archon King instead. I would honestly rather just avoid this guy, even if it means missing out on his armor. He's just that scary. But we're here now, and he's seen us, so let's buckle up, lock and load. There is some good news, as he doesn't have line of sight on quite a few members of the team. This allows us to hit a blaster bomb with no reaction turn from the King. He's two tiles out of the range of the plasma launcher though. That's a bummer. So the troops who are out of line of sight, we spread them out as much as possible to avoid his Devastate ability, which is basically just souped up blazing pinions, and we set a couple up on Overwatch. When he does get to react, he targets Chan. She was the only soldier with an action left, so it's actually good that he grabbed her out of everyone, because it's one less reaction turn that he'll get to use against us. Chan takes a beat down, but it thankfully doesn't actually do that much damage. It does leave her disoriented though. We fire with failed for the holo targeting, and here the king unleashes Devastate. 
Now, it was really dumb to leave these guys on the roof of this building. The ground is actually safer with the Archon King, as Devastate will cause you to take fall damage, in addition to the high-velocity missile exploding right in your face. Now, again, Fail doesn't take much damage, but he is unconscious now. We've still got Metla, who can revive him, though, and Leeson takes a hit as we continue firing. The King then escapes with 63 HP remaining, He's still going to be annoying the next time we encounter him, but at least we've made it through this mission with minimal damage, and the rest of the mission goes on without issue. Now, truth be told, we could do the last mission whenever we like at this point. I just really want those ruler armors, so I'm kind of just chilling until we can take out those pesky rulers. So let's get down to it. I hit the final facility housing a ruler, knowing that this one has to be the Viper King. And sure enough, we run into him very quickly. Now he's at the bottom of a ridge, and can only see one of our troops. So I set up the world's greatest Overwatch trap with the rest of the team, only to activate another pod. Thanks to tactical analysis, I can just move out of their line of sight, and they won't be able to hurt us on their turn but the Viper King doesn't actually get up to us in one move. So now he's at the bottom of the ridge with line of sight on zero members of our team. We know where he is, but he doesn't know where we are, and we can exploit this, and you better believe we will exploit this. But before we do, we need to take out that other pod, which is actually quite easy. Now see that square that we can't move on to? That's because the Viper King is there, and we can throw grenades and other AoE attacks that don't require line of sight until the cows come home. The Viper King will just stand there all day and take the hits. The game won't tell you how much HP it has left, so just keep attacking until the ruler falls or until you're out of attacks. After a seemingly endless onslaught of grenades, heavy weapons, and capacitor discharges, we take out the Viper King in one of the cheapest victories of all time. But I have no shame over this. In fact, I feel pretty good about it. As always, the rest of the mission goes off without a hitch. We've got so many high-level soldiers that regular enemies don't pose too much of a threat to us at this point. We have a Gorilla Op, and by this stage we've put Leeson in the Serpent Armor, partly because he has death from above now as well, so the grappling hook will be useful, and partly because he just seems like the kind of guy that would enjoy wearing the skin of a giant deceased snake. Anyway, horrible pot activation with three of them at once. We start with a bang and hit with the blaster bomb. Leeson holds things down with death from above, and it's a little worrying that our lives are in this man's hands. The Serpent Armor's Frostbite ability and two Mimic Beacons protect us from taking damage, but that's a lot of resources to burn through, and there's still quite a few active enemies. And the device we're meant to be protecting is on fire, so it could lose all its health any turn now. We need to finish this up quick. Heh, <laughs> sorry, did I say quick? The Archon King is here, so quick is probably not an option anymore. We've also used up all our Mimic Beacons, and still have three Archons, and a Shield Bearer active. Failed activates Protection Protocol on Cat, which increases her defense, but it also gives her a free Overwatch shot. We then use Combat Protocol, which we've now also put on Failed, thanks to the Training Center, to take out the Shield Bearer. A Capacitor Discharge on the King thankfully disorientates him, I'm not sure how many of his abilities this will block, but I guess we'll find out pretty soon. But then the best thing ever happens. Just like with the Viper King, the Archon King gets a reaction turn and he moves forward. But due to the disorientation, he can't move very far. He ends up behind a wall and falls completely out of line of sight. No more reaction turns for him, and we can now focus on cleaning up the rest of the pods. And I have to say, hitting three Archons at once with a Plasma Blaster is very satisfying. One does survive and attacks Pyrotechnic. We heal him up and then take it out on our turn. And now we've got the King to worry about, 
And you know what they say about the king. If you're going to shoot, you better not miss. We hammer him with capacitor discharges from beyond line of sight and then move forward with failed. The king gets a glimpse of him and moves forward, but he's still not moving very fast. And he again finishes his turn out of line of sight. But he's actually moved close enough that we can lob some grenades at him while still remaining out of line of sight. So it wasn't the best play on his part. If you're ever in this position yourself, you'll know if your attack hit the ruler because they'll make a noise every time they take damage. And look, I get some people might see this as cheesing, but you also have to understand, I'm not opposed to cheesing, not in the slightest. And given how OP the rulers are, I really don't mind fighting dirty to beat them. So we set up an overwatch trap with everyone except Leeson, and then we send the madman himself in to stare the king down. Sometimes to fight a monster, you need to use a monster. Well, the king, probably horrified at the ponytailed psychopath before his eyes, tries to flee, and he spawns the portal really close to him. I guess because he's not moving as far, the portal spawns closer. I resign myself to the fact he's going to escape, but Chan has other ideas and stops him in his tracks just before he reaches the portal. Now we've only got one ruler left. We load out Drifter with the Icarus suit, because of course we do, and I always like giving the Icarus suit to a specialist. I just imagine them flying around with their gremlin like Iron Man, obliterating everything before them. It seems pretty cool. We have a supply raid now, and do you remember in the Reaper run when Outrider rained down the commander's love all over those lost? Well... How about a part two featuring your boy Drifter? Thirteen enemies down in a single turn. And he could have kept going, but we ran out of enemies. Now the Berserker Queen shows up, and I almost feel sorry for her. It's been so long since we saw her, and we've become so powerful, while well, she's still just on her 15 HP that we left her on. Have you ever been in that situation where you haven't seen a friend for years, and you're doing great, accomplishing really good things with your life? but you find out that they're still struggling and you feel really bad for them, that's kind of like this. I mean, just look at what we have here. Her and her mutons are legitimately running away from us. Have you ever seen the queen do this? Because I haven't. It's really just kind of sad. Anyway, I said I almost feel sorry for her, not that I actually do. We deliver some XCOM style justice, and that's some more awesome armor for us. And for the record, I believe she was running towards some loss to attack, not away from us, but it's not as funny that way. We've now eliminated the Chosen, and the Rulers, and completed all story research. So you know what time it is, we're wrapping this campaign up. I purchase all the intel buffs for the Network Tower, Two of them increase our chance to crit, so we may be dealing some big damage. 19 damage on a Spectre, yeah, that's pretty big. Though to be fair, blue screen rounds did help with that one. And that's actually the only pod we engage with on our way to the main building. I mean, we take out a turret, but that doesn't really count. On the roof, we've got a Codex and two Archons. One of the Archons survives and goes for Blazing Pinions. It's obliterated before its missiles even hit the roof. And the best part is the roof is now demolished, so we can just jump down and hack the objective. That might be the easiest time I've had on this mission. But now we head off to the real final mission. I've equipped Cat with the Rage Armor for this one, and as usual, we can't use the Commander's Avatar. He's just here for emotional support. Well, that, and because we can't remove him from the mission. My plan for this one is to make maximum use of Overwatch creep, 
Our specialists are really good at overwatching, so we'll hopefully be able to inflict a lot of damage on the enemies before they've even engaged us. We're very quickly accosted by some mutons and an archon. One of the mutons panics at the sight of the rage suit, so yeah, I've never talked about this since we've never been able to use ruler armor. But basically, vipers have a chance to panic at the side of the serpent armor, mutons at the side of the rage armor, and archons with the Icarus armor. And it makes sense. Like, if you were an alien and saw a crazy person toting a gun and wearing the flesh of your species' strongest champion as a suit, you'd probably be a bit nervous too. I know I definitely would. Now I'm not sure if Berserkers can also panic at the Rage Suit. I'm guessing they probably can't. Mama's way too angry to be scared after all. Also, the Archon actually panicked too, but didn't live long enough for us to really notice. A Sectopod then graces us with its presence, and it actually has some Mutons with it. I'm not sure if these guys are from that first pod we saw. Whatever, one of the heavy mechs goes down and the sector pod is left with only 12 HP after we're done overwatching. That's through 5 points of armor too, as we're not shredding. So yeah, our specialists are pretty good at overwatching by this point. We take out the pod, except for a single muton. Leeson does have a shot left, but no line of sight. So I go on overwatch, and yep, that muton runs right into its demise. A whole pod of sectoids is up next. They're a fair distance away, so I fall back and let them come to us. With tactical analysis, they won't be able to attack, even if they come into our line of sight. On the next turn, we hammer them, and our guns are doing so much damage, they're a guaranteed one-shot. This, my friends, is what we call a massacre. The next pod is the usual two Andromedons and four Mutons, so definitely a bigger threat. DJ has run and gun as a hidden ability, so charges out to meet them. And then, with the power of grapple and death from above, Leeson starts laying waste to these jokers. The Muton can be a one-shot if we get a good damage roll, but it's not guaranteed. The Andromedons, meanwhile, just have way too much health and they survive. We use a Mimic Beacon, and the only thing that can go wrong is if the first Andromedon one-shots it, and yes, we're safe. We take out one of the Andromedons, but the other's shell survives, even despite using a capacitor discharge, which was actually really silly of me in retrospect. If we weren't going to finish the enemy anyway, there was no point wasting such a powerful ability. It does get a punch off on Leeson, but his serpent armor allows him to dodge, and he only takes minimal damage. Another Archon and two Mutons, and the Archon again panics. The Mutons are easy to eliminate, and the Archon is too busy in the fetal position to attack us next turn. It was definitely worth the extra time to grab these ruler armors. We finish the Archon and keep pressing forward. Some more Archons fly in, but they're overwatched into a better place. And finally, two big old gatekeepers are here. I use the blaster bomb to shred, and then we open fire. I was hoping to grapple with Leeson, but the grapple appears to be bugged and we can't use it. When this happens, I think if you click off the soldier, then back on them, it usually fixes the problem, but I didn't know this at the time of recording. So we use the Icarus jump with Drifter instead, this isn't ideal, as we can only use it twice per mission, but we need the high ground to exploit death from above. And exploit we do, mopping up the entire pod in a single turn. So we're into the final chamber, and we've only used one blaster bomb, one mimic beacon, one medikit, and one capacitor discharge. That's actually really good, as we still have plenty of tools available for the avatars. Chan has the Rupture ability, which hits the first avatar, meaning the rest of the squad is going to inflict increased damage. We take out the avatar so quickly that we're able to finish one of the Archons and freeze the other with Frost Bomb. Two lots of Vipers teleport in, and I use the Blaster Bomb with Cat. It may be overkill, but watching a whole pot of Vipers be obliterated in one shot, I think was worth it. Capacitor Discharge and a single shot from Chan takes out the other pot of Vipers. We then finish the Archon, and the chamber is actually clear of enemies. I don't think that's happened in any of these runs so far. 
The second avatar has some faceless and codexes as backup. Another blaster bomb shreds the avatar's armor, inflicts good damage, and one-shots one of the faceless. Can't complain with that outcome. Needless to say, we finish it off quite quickly. Drifter then goes to town on the reinforcements, leaving only a single codex alive. And interestingly, the remaining codex shoots at Drifter instead of going for a psionic bomb. I guess we made it mad. Now the next lot of reinforcements are kind of scary, with some vipers and some berserkers. We start with a capacitor discharge to weaken the berserkers, Drifter finishes the codex while Leeson single-handedly clears all the vipers from his side of the map. A second capacitor discharge then leaves the berserkers with so little health that Drifter can finish them all from the high ground, and the chamber is again all clear. I mean, imagine being the third avatar at this point. You warp in, thinking you're going to save the day, and see literally every single reinforcement sent has been vaporized, and there's just these six mad dogs just waiting for you, grinning like crazed savages and pointing their guns squarely at your head. Chan overwatches a pot of faceless as they come in and drops two of them, one of them is actually frozen in place, which is a fairly terrifying visual image. This is like taxidermy gone wrong or something. Anyway, we ignore the Avatar's entourage and go straight for the boss. We hit the Avatar with our final blaster bomb, and then fire away as usual. Cat punches it in the face with Rage Strike, sending it teleporting over to DJ, who claims the final victory for us. Not bad for a zombie man. And so there you have it, you most certainly can beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen with only specialists. And my oh my, that final mission was a beatdown for Advent. It's pretty weird, because of the hidden abilities from the training center, and the extra gear we get from Chosen and Rulers, I think this run was actually made easier by the DLCs. Now that's weird to think about, as I believe the general consensus is that the DLC overall makes the game harder. We obviously had some hiccups in the early game, but by the end, our army of specialists were nigh unstoppable. And it sure was nice being able to train as many soldiers as we liked. I'm actually tempted to try these vanilla classes without any of the DLC buffs. Like no chosen weapons, no alien ruler weapons or armors, and no training center perks. I think that would make things a lot more difficult. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm still gonna play War of the Chosen normally in the upcoming videos with the other classes. I won't be giving myself those extra restrictions, partly because we wanna keep things comparable to the specialist run, and partly because I've already recorded some of them and can't go back and change it now. But maybe one day in the future, we could try these runs again without any of that extra stuff and see how much harder it becomes. Let me know if that's something that you'd be interested in watching. Now, before we call it a day, look at this stat. We hacked four enemies the whole run. A campaign of only specialists and we hacked a measly four enemies. Now personally, I think this is a sign that hacking enemies in this game really wasn't implemented very well. The reward usually just doesn't outweigh the risk. Alright, I hope you enjoyed this one. Our next challenge run is going to be rangers only, so I hope you'll hit the subscribe button and join me for that. And finally, I just have to say, the channel has been doing so well recently. There's been so much positive feedback and support and lots of people have been giving me really great ideas for future challenge runs. Seeing people enjoy my videos gives me so much motivation to keep getting more content out for you to enjoy. All of you are incredible, and I really appreciate the support. Thank you all so much, and I hope to continue this awesome journey with you. Have a great day. Don't say